I just want to introduce our speaker. He is Colonel Lamar Davis. He's the superintendent for the Louisiana State Patrol. He took the superintendent position back in October of 2020, and he's responsible for 2,600 employees. And he's been working to implement, implement reform across the agency. And he has over 25 years of experience in law enforcement. So I'll have Colonel Davis come on up here. to serve, and it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, but before I move on, I want to thank Shannon and Michelle for inviting me and giving me the opportunity to speak about our agency and things that we're doing with our agency. Um, but I also want to take a moment to thank all of the employees of the Department of Public Safety. Uh, as mentioned, you know, we have over 2,600 employees. And everything that we've been going through as an agency, as a state, as a community, They've been right there. They've been coming in, whether it be the, the uh, pandemic, um, whether it's been the um, weather events, they leave their families and they come out and they make sure that we provide the service that we're supposed to provide. And I'm so thankful to them. So I want to uh, thank them for all of their service and their sacrifice. Uh, I want to thank our communities for our support. You know, you know, as we go through it, we're all in this together. And that's one thing that we'll hear from, and we're all in it together. So regardless of what we go through, regardless of you know, what happens in our community, it's incumbent upon us to do our best because we're all in it together. And as we do our individual best, then we all benefit from it. And, and that's kind of how I've moved throughout my life and my uh, profession. So um, I'll kind of get into some of the things that um, we're dealing with as an agency, where we're going forward. Uh, as an agency, and then I'll kind of open the floor up to um, for questions. Uh, one of the things that I really um, want to do is, if you would, just bear with me, is take a moment of silence um, and support all of the victims of violent crimes. Uh, so if you would, just give me a moment of silence, please. Thank you. Um, as you all may know, um, we recently lost a, a trooper to um, violent crimes. And in doing so, that rocked the core of our agency. Um, but I will tell you this, it did not impact us one bit in the sense of our mission. It only strengthened our resolve to perform our mission and do so in a professional manner. It only brought us closer together and not just as an agency, as a profession, but as a community. Because the overwhelming support that we received as a result of that loss really brought us closer to our communities. And again, we, we've got to work as a community to get rid of the violent crime that, that's plaguing our communities. But um, that's vitally important. And, you know, when I look at, when you look at what we do, I'm, as mentioned, I'm Department of Public Safety, I'm State Police Superintendent, but I'm also also serve as the Deputy Secretary of the Department of Public Safety. And it's important to note that you know when we talk about our public safety officials and our personnel, that's inclusive of Fire Marshal's Office, Highway Safety Commission, um, that's inclusive of Local Fire Petroleum and Gas Commission, All Spill Coordinator's Office, and Office of Motor Vehicles. Those men and women come to work every day and they do their very best to provide services so that our communities can continue to thrive and live and build and I'm so proud of them. But that, that's a large area and large area of responsibility. And most times when we talk about um, our personnel, most of you all as I speak today may be visualizing men and women in uniform. But it's that support staff that carries us. There's no way we can do our jobs and perform our missions as successfully as we have without that support staff. 
So again, I submit to you, uh, I'm very proud of what they do, and you'll, you'll hear that as I continue. So let's get to the meat of it. As I thought about you know, what I would talk about today, um, I think it's evident that you all want to hear about what's going on in our agency. <laughs> um, so I thought it'd be easy and, and it'd be best for everybody that I get right into the, the meat of what's going on. Um, as you've seen, we've experienced, as I mentioned before, um, a lot of challenges throughout the year. Um, global pandemic, weather events that we've experienced, but we've also, as an agency, experienced significant challenges from within our agency. And at the heart of those um, challenges are reports of um, involving use of force. Um, I'll tell you, that touched me personally, um, not only as the agency here, but as a person. You know, whenever you hear where our personnel are not performing their duties uh, in a professional manner, that's one thing. But whenever we're using excessive force, then that's impactful, and that impacts any and everybody in our communities. So um, for me, it's very, very important, it's vital that we put things into place to ensure that you know, we do not have instances of excessive force in our agency or in our profession. And that's exactly what we're doing. So I'll kind of go over some of those things. Um, and, and frankly, although some those incidents happened prior to my administration, I'm telling you right now, I am committed to making the changes necessary to ensure that it doesn't happen in the future or continue to happen. As I speak to you today, you're going to hear two things, service and accountability. Um, and the reason why that's important to me is because that is what has guided me throughout my career, not only here at State Police uh, for um, nearly 26 years, DPS, but also throughout my 21 years in, in the military. And as I've gone through, whether it be trials and tribulations or challenges, is that service mentality and that devotion to accountability that have gotten the best results in all of those situations. And that's, frankly, the direction that we're moving uh, with my agency and how we're going to continue to move and build with our agency. A um, couple things with that, you know, it's simple, it's my responsibility to, one, look at the issues that we have in our agency, whether it be past issues or present day issues. Uh, identify um, a plan to rectify those issues, and as we do, then we'll put that plan into place to ensure that it doesn't continue. And that we get the best out of our personnel. And that's exactly what we're committed to doing. And I say we because it's not just me. Since coming into this position, one of the initial things that I did was creating a leadership team that really looks at my vision of serving with compassion. You know, we do the patrol, we do the operational things very well. That's what we train on. Um, the areas where we, and frankly, not just as a agency, but as a profession and as a society, that we can stand to improve when we serve each other quite a little better. You know, as we serve each other individually, then what you'll find is not only are we better as individuals, we're better as a society. I mean, it seems simple, but it's not always evident in what we do. So I'm really focusing on serving with compassion, and that's the foundation for how we're moving forward as an agency. And what you should already be seeing is the amount of and type of service that we provide to our citizens. And, and, and I think I'll get into that a little later. So, um, but what it also does is it sets the foundation for our future generations. And while I'm speaking of that, I'm kind of excited because you know, we've got a, our historic class 100 coming up this coming Sunday. Um, 100 Academy in 85 years. Very proud of that um, because we now will have 64 men and women to assimilate into state police family, into the Louisiana state police family, the EPS family, and our communities to further serve the mission of public safety. And I'm also proud of that class for another reason. Uh, 
it is one of the most diverse academies in the history of our um, I think that's important to note because you know, our society has become more diverse. Uh, it's become um, less monolithic and, and more diverse. And as we look at that, we definitely want to emulate our society. And that, as I see it, is, a, is value added. You know, when we look at diversity, and I, I do want to speak to that for a second, you know, oftentimes, depending upon your thoughts on that matter or that topic, depending upon where you are, on which side of the aisle, may determine what your thoughts are, or thoughts are of diversity. And for me, diversity has always been value added. Uh, from the day of leaving and going into the military, being around someone that's different from me, that has a different history from me, that maybe look different, or act different, or think differently than me, has always been value added. It's always given me a different perspective. And Upon getting a different perspective, it's opened my mind to one inclusion, but also the possibilities of what could be. And that's what diversity means to me. And I, I, that's what I'm building throughout our department. And as we begin and continue to build that mindset of being more diverse and it being value added, then you will see the benefits of it. And I think we will all see the benefits of it. So, again, I'm very proud of um, that next academy coming up because I think it's going to really help us. And, and beyond that, it's going to help us, you know, on the operational side. You know, currently we are approximately 200 troopers sh short. 200 troopers short. And while that within itself is significant, you know, the impact is really vital. You know, when we look at the rise in fatalities, the rise in uh, serious injury crashes. You know, when you do not have, you do not see troopers on the road stopping those aggressive drivers, those distracted drivers, those impaired drivers, then that impacts safety for everybody. Not just those that are impaired or distracted, but those that are doing what they're supposed to be doing. Because they may ultimately come into contact with those impaired, distracted, or aggressive drivers. And that's not a good result. So. It's very important to me to get our troopers and get more troopers on the road as quickly as possible. And that way we can save more lives. One of the areas, as I mentioned before, that uh, has been of note has been our use of force. Uh, recently, we put out our 2020 uh, use of force statistics, which um, indicated that 67% of the use of force uh, impacted or involved black or brown males. And I'll be the first to tell you on the surface, um, as well as um, well then that's, that's the survey. Okay. But I'm also here to tell you that you know, we're working to determine the significance of that information. We want to delve into that information and see if that's actually it. You know, there are some variables that we're determining that may have impacted those numbers. Oftentimes when we look at it, you all see troopers on the side of the road. But when we look at events, whether it be uh, as re recently as um, the Bayou Classic, you know, we are being asked to move beyond our tra traditional roles in law enforcement and highway safety and move into our communities. And sometimes that involves us moving into communities that are impacted by violent crimes and so forth. And we don't choose who we come into contact with. We follow the evidence, we follow the information, we follow the intelligence, and from there we do our jobs. And we, we will continue to do our jobs to try and impact public safety. Um, but it doesn't mean that we should not be taking a look at this, this information to determine if there is something that we can agree upon, and that's exactly what we're doing. Um, you know, with that said, our troopers have encountered over 5.7 million motorists in the past decade. And that's dealing with uh, traffic stops, arrests, and motorist assist. And of that 5.7 million motorists, we've only encountered use of force incidents at 0.52% of the time. That's less than 1%. That's significant. 
And while it is significant, I do realize that we do have some areas that we must continue to work on and continue to improve upon to ensure the safety of not only our personnel, but the safety of our citizens. So we continue to put in that work and do so. And I'll tell you this, the overwhelming majority of our DPS employees are nominal, professional, public servants. But, there's always a but, <laughs> um, we also have identified some personnel that have not acted in accordance with our uh, guidelines, with our core values. It's important that you all know that when we do encounter those employees, depending upon the significance of their behavior, um, then we will act accordingly. You know, we're, we're going to do everything necessary to try and change any negative behavior that we encounter. And when that doesn't change, and, and you know, I, I use personally kind of like a four-tier platform. You know, I come in as an agency head, I provide my vision, and I set the expectations. And that's exactly what we've done by saying, hey, we're going to form our mission with professionalism and with compassion. Okay, so I, now I'm setting the foundation, I'm setting the vision, and I'm setting the expectations by which we're going to do our jobs and our duties and responsibilities. And as we do so, and we find that we have personnel that may not be acting in accordance or, be, or behaving in that manner, then what we're going to do is we're going to coach, train, mentor, and retrain. We're going to try to mentor those folks to change that negative behavior into positive. And then from there, we're going to continue to train and retrain as necessary. But when we find that they're now moving towards policy violations, then we're going to discipline. Plain and simple. And we're going to use aggressive discipline approach based upon the severity of the incident, based upon the severity of their behavior. Okay? And when that does not work, I submit to you that we will terminate and, if necessary, arrest. I uh, think you've seen uh, one of me coming into this department uh, as agency head that I will take whatever necessary action to ensure that our people are performing as they should. And when they don't, then I'm going to hold them accountable. But you can likewise hold me accountable. So, you know, simply put, you know, the professionalism, the accountability, um, the proper treatment of our personnel. It's non-negotiable. Uh, we're not accepting anything less than the best of my personnel. Now, uh, like I said, we're going to give them everything that we're supposed to give them. We're going to give them the tools, we're going to give them the training, we're going to give them uh, the resources. But so we're going to also expect them to perform and behave as they should, as professionals. And then we're going to let them do their jobs. And so as you know, LSP moves for forward as an agency, as I mentioned before, we're working through some of those staffing challenges. And not just the staffing challenges. When you're 200 short and you're continuously being asked to work other missions, it impacts some of our missions. And I'll give you kind of a comparison. You know, in 2020, during the Thanksgiving holiday period, um, we experienced seven crashes that resulted in eight fatalities. One year later, with 200, and not that we lost all of our 200 troopers in one year, but we did lose a large number. This particular year, we experienced 10 crashes, resulting in 16 fatalities. We put in, um, we ended up arresting 38 persons for DWI, drug while intoxicated. Uh, we administered 633 speeding citations. And a lot of those speeding citations are very, very high speeds. We're, we're talking, you know, 100 plus high 90s. Okay. Um, and the most troubling part for me is the use of seatbelts. We issued 96 seatbelt citations. Most of the fatalities that we responded to involved people that were not wearing seatbelts. Something so simple as wearing your seatbelt can save your life, and yet we still have people that do not do it. So when we issue a ticket for a seatbelt violation or a speeding 
It's not because we want to take money from you. It's because we want to save your lives. That's how important it is. And we're not just trying to save your life. We're trying to save everybody else's life on that highway. Now I'd like to kind of get into some of the other areas of my department where we've made some changes. As mentioned, you know, I've made some significant changes upon coming into this position. One of the initial changes I made was really changing the leadership. I thought it was important to bring on leaders that shared my vision, shared my direction. And as we did that, uh, it was important to really take a look at all of our leadership in our department. Um, I have some innovative, phenomenal leaders uh, as part of my team, and I'm excited to work with them day in and day out. Uh, we're, we're making some, some uh, major changes here. But we've also made some significant gains in other areas, and one of those areas includes technology. As I mentioned before, one of the foundations to success for me has been accountability. And in the past, we have not had the technology to really hold our people accountable. We expected our supervisors to really go through a whole bunch of paperwork in order to hold their persons and their personnel accountable. Uh, since that time, we really looked at our technology. We put in some major components to help our supervisors and to help our personnel, frankly. One of those is our computer-aided dispatch. Uh, about two years ago, three, well, no, three years ago, I took over as the technology commander for our agency. And we're looking at implementing a computer-aided dispatch. And computer-aided dispatch, for those that are not familiar with it, is basically a system that's utilized to, one, dispatch our personnel, but also record all of their activities as they are dispatched to sort of the event, all of their events. Well, we did not have a statewide computer-aided dispatch. We had systems that resided locally in each troop that did not communicate with all of the other systems. So if someone was doing something in New Orleans, they could not necessarily look to Monroe to get that information without having to pick up the phone, call, and ask the guy in Monroe, hey, can you look at this or look this up for me? That's ridiculous in this day and time. So, we're blessed to be able to bring in a company to assist us and give us a statewide CAD system, a computer-aided dispatch system. And what that does for us is it increases our accountability tenfold by giving everyone access to that system by putting in that information, regardless of whether you're in Monroe Street, Fort New Orleans, or Lafayette, you will have access to the same information once it's in. Now, that helps us with regards to criminal activity and identifying and tracking criminal activity, but it also helps us with managing our employees. When we find that we have employees that are not acting in accordance, it gives us an easier or more succinct system to look into to be able to determine in a more expeditious manner whether or not they're performing their duties as they should or whether or not we have concerns that we need to address. So it's very important uh, to implement that CAD system. Um, but we're not stopping there. We're bringing an e-citation system uh, to our agency again. That will be a statewide system. Now, when we look at issuing a, a paper citation to someone, it takes 15 to 20 days for someone to be able to go back and pay their ticket and or move beyond that. With the e-citation system that we're looking to implement, we're looking at within 24 hours you being able to take care of your fine and move beyond that particular instance but also gives us an opportunity to once again track our personnel's activity in a more efficient and expeditious manner. And the, the largest or other large component will be a statewide e-crash system that we're looking to implement. Again, all of these systems by themselves are value to add to our system and of course multiply, but they will all talk to each other, which will give us at, the, at a moment's notice, the ability to go in, press one or two buttons, and retrieve the necessary information and analytics that we need to follow trends, to follow the crime, as well as to put forth a plan together to build upon that information. So I'm looking forward to you know, doing that. Um, our CAD system, we're on the final phases of deployment with that and implementing that. So I expect by the first or second quarter of the coming year to have that fully implemented. Our citation system, we're um, looking to identify vendors and 
get that system implemented. So probably the first or second quarter to actually start moving towards identifying the vendor to um, bring on board. And as far as our e crash system, we have identified the vendor and we're looking to start the implementation process by the second quarter of the coming year. Okay. I think that, that will help us. And as I mentioned, you know, the evolution of these systems will put our agency in a position to become paperless, but it will also increase our ability to communicate more effectively and increase our accountability. Um, but that's not just where we're stopping. You know, um, there are several areas to make an agency great. And one of the main areas includes really the expectations of our employees, knowing what's expected of them. And we do that through our policies. Um, we have made significant changes to our policies. And a lot of those policy changes have included um, police reform measures that we find that have been beneficial in reducing a lot of the um, incidents that we've experienced in the past. Uh, one of those includes a uh, duty to intervene. When you look at a lot of the situations throughout our nation with law enforcement, one of the main issues that agencies have been faced with is how to build that system of intervening, having your personnel intervene in situations where other officers or employees are not acting appropriately. And that's exactly what we've started looking at. So we have taken that head on. We have changed, one, changed our policy, but we're also bringing on the training to supplement that policy change. It's not just about changing the policy, it's also, also about making sure that we're incorporating the proper and the best behavior among our employees. And in order to do that, we have to, one, tell them what's expected of them, and two, we have to provide them the proper training to show them what's expected of them. And three, we have to support them in those expectations. And that starts with me. So that's exactly what we're doing. We are bringing on that training to help ensure that they understand that they have the support of our administration, but they also have the tools necessary to intervene. If they come across, whether it be one of our employees or another law enforcement professional that are not acting in accordance with state laws, policies, or just in, in best practices. And as we do that, I think, again, we will, as a profession and as communities, see a decline in a lot of the excessive force incidents that we've seen across the nation. We've also enhanced and changed our body worn camera policy. Uh, you know, I was on, I was on a member of the team that uh, brought body worn cameras to our agency. And I will tell you, upon <laughs> doing so, it was not readily received initially. I don't mind saying that. You know, most people thought it was someone spying on them. Uh, they didn't see it as um, a protection for the officer and the citizens. And that's exactly what it is. But once they gained an understanding, once they saw the proof of the pudding, they realized that, you know, sometimes we have some citizens who may think that, hey, if I say this and they give me out this ticket, then we were able to, as opposed to initiate the investigation, all we had to do is go take a look at the body worn camera and say, it did or did not happen. If it did happen and it's wrong, then we need to deal with it and deal with our employee. But likewise, if it did not happen and we clear our employee, they can go back to work doing their job and they don't have to worry about anything. And that's what we want. So that's another benefit <coughs> to all of the technology that we're bringing. And I think, again, as it becomes widely accepted, you will see not only as in our agency the acceptance increase, but also in our profession. Oftentimes, it's just an understanding of what is expected of our officers. Okay. But we have made some changes in our body-worn camera, and I'll speak to some of those. One of them um, mandates that our officers ensure that their body-worn cameras are turned on whenever they go on duty. And this is our patrol. Um, we do not have, and I'll answer that up front, we do not have body-worn cameras issued to every trooper. Um, frankly, it's a significant cost. And when we look at some of our troopers have what we call sedentary or static uh, duties, uh, 
or administrative duties, they are not really um, working with the public on a daily basis. Now. So to incur that cost, and that means well, increasing possible taxes and so forth to try and pay for that. So we want to be judicious about how we spend our funding and our, um, our money. Uh, one of the other areas um, that we made changes in that policy is mandating the transportation of prisoners be recorded at all times, uh, unless they're in areas uh, which prohibit that, such as hospitals and such. Uh, mandates the recording of travel to pursuits or known use and force encounters. Uh, we've also outlined the procedures for supervisory quarter, quarterly reviews. Uh, as I mentioned before, one of the major issues that we've had is accountability. And as we move towards building more accountability in our agency, I've mandated that and I've held all of our supervisors accountable. Now, I find it difficult to go and only deal with the trooper or deal with the officer when they do something wrong. I want to look at that supervisor. I want to look and see what have they done to curb or change that behavior. Is it, is it the first time? Is it, if it's the second time, then what was done the first time? And was it, was it necessary or was it significant? And did it change the behavior? Okay. And that is important to me because I'm not there with all of our troops on a daily basis, but that supervisor is. So it's important that they understand that they have a significant role in ensuring that our troopers are doing things safely, but also uh, as according to our policies. So uh, I've really, really focused in on supervisory accountability, not just trooper accountability, but supervisory accountability. And as you see the change in them, and you see that growth in those supervisors, then you will see the change in behavior from negative to positive in our troopers. But I will tell you, sometimes you just have a trooper that just does not do what they're supposed to do. And that's when the discipline comes into play. And we'll do what we need to do. So uh, again, that policy is important though. You know, initially, one of the areas of that particular policy that concerned me surrounded um, supervisor review of the body one camera of their personnel. And one word in the past, our older policy, which said that our supervisors shall review their body worn camera, the personnel's body worn camera periodically. Uh, well, that to me, <laughs> when you look at periodically, when is that? How can you measure that? How can you hold accountable, a supervisor accountable to periodically? Because that can be once a year, okay? As long as it's consistently once a year. So, you know, we looked at what we can accomplish. We've now mandated that our supervisors review their body, their personnel's body worn cameras, at least four of their personnel every quarter. Okay? Not just body worn camera, but in court. And I think what that does is one, it sets an expectation of our personnel that your supervisors will be looking at your, your activities. Not just body worn camera, you use force reports, all your other reports. But they will be looking at it. Okay? And two, it sets the expectation of supervisory accountability within our supervisors. That you have a job to do. And it's incumbent upon you to do your job so that we're not having to terminate employees or arrest employees. We can reach them before it gets to that point. And we spend a lot of money training our employees. We do not want to terminate or arrest any of them. You know, we want to keep them, if at all possible. But when we find we can't, then we will remove them. Another area uh, of contention was our use of force policy. Uh, as I mentioned before, you know, that's one of the areas that I really took a deep dive at, looking at those policies. And what we've done with this particular policy is basically looked at it in depth and made some significant changes. Uh, one, defining chokeholds, positional asphyxia, retaliatory force, and de-escalation. And as we define that, and it gives our, again, our employees an idea of what's expected of them. But we've also expanded the policy to include a ban on chokeholds, a ban on the use of force impact weapons um, to the head or neck, unless deadly force is justified, and a mandate that all of our troopers and DPS officers carry a less than lethal weapon. This is important because, you know, when we come up on certain situations, and if the only thing that you have is your gun, 
And that puts everybody in an adversarial situation. Regardless of how significant the situation is, we understand that that's a tool. But we have other tools, less than lethal force tools, that can accomplish the job <coughs> the majority of the time. So we mandated that they carry those less than lethal uh, tools and weapons. And by doing that, I believe that we will definitely get the best outcome of even an adversarial situation. If you're using a taser as opposed to a sidearm, then you achieve a better outcome. Nobody loses their life. They may feel a little pain, they may go to jail, but they're alive. Okay, so that was very important to make that change. Uh, we've also mandated that troopers and DPS officers carry their taser in a Class A and Class B uniform. Um, and we've made some other changes, such as um, mandating that administrative leave uh, be administered when deadly forces are used. And I, I think it's important there because oftentimes what people do not realize whenever we use force, especially deadly force, when someone um, loses their life, at the hands of one of our personnel, it impacts our people. It impacts them mentally, it impacts them emotionally. Oftentimes when we go out there and we perform our jobs, when we look at what's required of our personnel, you go out to a crash scene, you see a six month old baby that may have just died as a result of a crash, and now you take this trooper, they work that crash, and they may have a six month old at home, they may have a two-year-old at home, but they have to work that crash. And as they work that crash, then we expect them to leave that crash and go and work another crash, where there may be another fatality. <clears throat> they see some of the most traumatic parts of our society, of any profession, them along with firemen and of course medical professionals. And that's a lot to deal with. So I've mandated that whenever a use of force is used that results in the loss of life, then they're going to take some time and some peer support counseling. And they'll get a chance to breathe before bringing them back <coughs> to face the job that we expect of them. Okay. But beyond that, we've also made some other changes in our policy with uh, the change in our pursuit policy. We've updated not mind the provisions of the ramming, which now prohibits the ramming unless the um, authorization of deadly force is necessary. Some of the other areas that I thought was important for us to change included training. Um, one of the areas I changed was mandating that implicit bias training for all personnel being included. Um, and that's top to bottom. That's inclusive of me on down. Uh, I have, I thought that was important because, you know, when we look at implicit bias, oftentimes, most people don't realize that they look upon other people based upon their <coughs> lenses, based upon their environment, based upon where they come from. Again, we talk about that diversity, that difference, that we look at people. Sometimes it's not always a positive thing. Sometimes it is. But it's important for us, especially as a profession that comes across all different cultures, that we understand our implicit, and our, our implicit biases. And as we do so, then we're better able to deal with those adverse situations by uh, which we have to deal with people. Understanding, well, this may be how I feel. Now I can take that information. I can use it when necessary to benefit that situation so that I can reach the best possible outcome. My understanding that I may look at someone a certain way, it causes me to draw attention and say, hey, back up, slow down. Okay, now I need to look at this. And likewise, if I am now on scene with multiple law enforcement professionals, and I now understand that I have the support of my administration and I see someone acting in that manner, I can go put my hands on that show and say, hold on, hold on. Let me take this particular incident. I'll handle that. You take a breather. 
Okay, I see you getting upset. Because oftentimes, when people get upset, a lot of it is based upon miscommunication, a lot of it is based upon culture and things that really you don't understand, or you may, um, you may not necessarily understand that particular culture. So by instituting these training mechanisms, we can train our person, personnel to better handle these particular situations. So as I mentioned before, we've made some significant gains, we've made some significant changes, but that doesn't mean that our job is done. We have more work to be done, and we're going to commit to continuing that work. So again, I want to thank you um, for having me here. I want to thank all of our employees for the work that they do, they do day in and day out. And I will open it up for questions. Yes, sir. <clears throat> Colonel Davis, at Sound Off Louisiana, we've got a number of instances where we've received concerns about the Air Support Unit of State Police. They have asserted that there's reckless disregard for safety, for maintenance. They also have asserted that the uh, unit is basically running an in-house flight school, which they contend is contrary to LSP's mission for air support. With the recent revelation that uh, Joseph Dessens, the most recent pilot who was hired, had only had his solo flight certification for 19 days before he crashed the helicopter on October the 6th. Can you reassure NTSB officials and also those <clears throat> who are transported by LSP's air support that those operations are in fact sound and don't pose an elevated risk to their safety? Um, here's what I can tell you. I have the utmost confidence in our flight personnel. And the reason why that's important to me is because they fly me. <laughs> There's no more important reason than to have their confidence than to my personal safety. But yes, I can assure you of that. And, and let me speak to the training. You know, I've spent 21 years in the military. Uh, I've flown, and a lot of those missions that I've flown have been training missions. Our people do train. They have to train in order to remain proficient. So I expect them to train in the aircraft in which they fly. They, they will be doing so. But likewise, when you come out of any specific training, whether it be our state police academy, that does not, it certifies you that you've completed our course, but it doesn't mean that you are a subject matter expert in what you're performing. So like our troopers that come out the academy, they go through our driver's training, well, they may have a crash the next day, but it doesn't mean that they're not doing what they're supposed to do. So I have the utmost confidence in our air support team. They're phenomenal people and phenomenal pilots. Thank you, Colonel. Process of if you find any troopers specifically using excessive force, uh, what you do with that? Do they put them into a training or some leave? What are you doing to handle that? So, for me, it's several things that I look at. One, I want to determine what the origin is. Do they have problems? Do they have issues? Is there something else that's systemic that I may not know about? So, I want to look at the mental and emotional health of that trooper. Two, we do have policies that stipulate what we're going to do. And if they violate the policy, then they're going to be uh, investigated. And based upon what we determine in that investigation, we'll determine the outcome of their sustaining. And if they're to be disciplined and are terminated, then that's what we're going to do. Uh, if they violate those policies and or laws, that results in their need to be arrested, then we're going to arrest them. You mentioned earlier about systems being put in place, technology systems being put in place, so that when an event is occurring, let's say in New Orleans, and they can go, their <coughs> troopers will be able to go to a database and be able to communicate maybe with someone in Monroe to a more real time than this possible document latency issue that can occur where information isn't readily available because it's sitting on multiple databases or no data, possibly even no database. Are budgets established already to take these maybe conversations that are being put in place and vendors that have been identified to actually be able to implement these programs? Yes, sir. I'm basically uh, I'm building it out of my own budget. So I think it's very important for us to do. And wherever I find the availability, then I'm doing it. But the technologies that I've spoken of, the CAD RMS already built into the budget. E citation built into the budget. E crash we're <coughs> going to build into the budget. We're going to get it done. It's that important. That's right. 
Well, um, apparently everybody is very pleased with what you've done, and uh, I'm just wondering if you have any political aspirations. <laughs> <laughs> no, sir. <laughs> um, I'm a servant. I'm you know, before I even knew what that meant, uh, kids, uh, I just grew up, I, I believe that we're all better for giving to others. And, and that's something who I am. I, I have no political aspirations at all. Um, I, I just want to help people. Uh, where do you think uh, your agency has made, made the most progress so far with the things that you're working to reform? Technology. Uh, as I mentioned before, you know, in, in 2017, um, I think it was in 2017, the Office of Technology <coughs> Services, which manages all of our large scale technologies, um, based upon the legislature, uh, legislative requests, formed research to determine where we had gaps. And my agency served as one third of the entire state's most efficient area of technology. Um, that's prior to body worn cameras, the citation. When I came in in 2018 to look for that computer aided dispatch that can to show you how outdated we were in 2018, when I started working to get to implement that system, we were only one of four um, state police highway patrol agencies in the nation that did not have a CAD system. One of four out of all of the state police agencies across the nation. And we were the only one to have never had one or implemented one. So I feel very proud of the work that we've done. We've made some significant gains. We continue to make significant gains. And you all will see the results, not just in accountability, but in the output of being able to be more efficient. And that helps our entire state. Yes, ma'am. You talked previously about having an outside consultant to come in and sort of do a top-down look at some of the policies and practices in the agency. Have you found that consultant yet? And if so, can you talk about who it is and, and what the status of that work is? So we are not there at the point where we have signed the contract, but we have consulted with multiple uh, nationally recognized uh, companies, and we are narrowing that down. Uh, I do expect, um, probably within the first quarter, to be moving on the contract so that we can get that done. That we are moving towards getting that done. That's very important that we do that because you, you really can't fix what you don't know. So it's important for us to identify those gaps, identify those issues, and have it done objectively. And as we do so, then we'll work to resolve those and get those fixed. And you said the first quarter is when you're targeting hiring someone? That's when we're looking at it. We're hoping to get that. One contract. more question. Um, back in August, it was reported that uh, the state police is not tracking vaccination rates for troopers. If that's still the case. Can you explain why? Well, that's a voluntary, uh, actually, that's voluntary. So it, it, we take a look at our troopers to determine, we ask them who would volunteer that information. We're not at a point where we can mandate that information. But what we can do is we ask. And we do ask to give us a consensus as to uh, whether or not uh, we have a problem. What I will tell you is right now, I think we've been averaging about one to two positives. And when you look at an agency of our size, uh, again, that's very small as compared to some of the other One agencies. to two positives a day? Or well, just on a daily basis. So obviously, once you become positive, then that may run a week or two. So I mean, you're averaging one to two per day uh, for agency of our size. Uh, while I wish it was zero and consistently zero, um, I'm glad that it's not higher. All right, Colonel Davis, thank you so much. Thank you.